Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Greenbelt Baptist Church. My name is Steve, and I'm a pastor here, and it is, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to not only welcome you to worship this morning, uh, but I get to also call us to worship. As uh, I often remind us, uh, it's good to remember that what we do here is not us actually coming to serve God, though we do do that, but primarily our gathering is God calling us and doing within us what we cannot do ourselves. And so it is great to be reminded and great to rest in the reality that our God has saved us, He has saved us in His Son, and He is working and calling us now by His Spirit to do that which pleases Him, namely uplift and exalt our Savior. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad you're here, and uh, we'd love to get to meet you. There is on the bottom of your bulletin, there should be a little uh, visitor information slip, and you can fill that out and give that to myself or one of the deacons or other elders this morning. Uh, but usually I'll also be out by the front door, so I'd love to get to meet you if I haven't yet and answer any questions that you might have. Now let me begin our time this morning with reading from God's Word and praying and asking God to bless our time. From Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. All who gather in his temple shall cry, glory. All you who hear the voice of the Lord, come now and worship the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Lord's anointed, the Word of God incarnate, our Savior. Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we do thank you now for this time that you've given us. And we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased to not only equip us to worship you rightly, Lord, humble us so that we might be better fit to worship you in lowliness. But Lord, encourage us now. Encourage us in Christ. And lift us up, as it were, to the right hand of our Savior, to the right hand of you, our Father. And as we worship you here on earth, may it be as if we were in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this morning and we'll start singing uh, from hymn number 13, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Stop. 
him 656 a mighty fortress is our god is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient It is He, Lord Sabaoth, His name, from age to age the same, and He must win the battle. And though this threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. The Prince of Darkness grim, we tremble not for Him. Let's pray together now a confession 
prayer of confession to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for allowing us to come together this morning and worship you. Allowing us to greet and meet our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Not brothers and sisters by flesh and blood, Father, but brothers and sisters by the Spirit of Christ. And Father, I pray now that you would give us repentance for the sins that we bring against you and against our brothers and sisters here today. Father, I, I pray that you would forgive us for the hate that we hold in our hearts, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for our neighbors, and Father, even for our enemies. Father, you have called us to love and to serve them all. Father, forgive us for not doing so. Father, forgive us for not even joining in regular prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for not lifting them up to you and seeking their betterment. Father, we get into our busy routine, and we don't think twice about those brothers and sisters who you brought here with us today to worship you. So, Father, I just pray that you would continue to conform our hearts, to give us a desire to love and serve how you've called us to. Father, I also pray that you would give us repentant hearts for the way that we waste our time and we seek to entertain ourselves, to distract ourselves from our spiritual need for you. Father, we are much more likely to continue to scroll through our phone or turn on the television to pick up your word and to read it Father, I confess this myself and for our church. Father, I pray that you would continue to change our hearts to desire to be fed by your living and active word. You have given us something we can open on our bookshelf and hear you speak to us directly today. You have not left us in the dark. You have not left us without knowing who you are. So, Father, I just pray you continue to increase the desire of our heart to hear from our living God. Father, I praise you and thank you this morning as well for this church, that the word is preached here, that we can freely gather together and hear it without any real fear of persecution. And I think of our other brothers and sisters around the world who fear every time they gather, that they might be imprisoned, that they might be hurt, persecuted, physically assaulted for gathering in your name. Father, we praise you and thank you for just the blessing that it is to be able to come together, sing your praises, hear your word preached, and even pray together. Father, as we prepare to take the communion supper together, I ask that you just continue to open our eyes. Father, that we would remember that not only do we take this bread and cup in remembrance of you, as a grace to our heart to remind us of what our Savior Jesus Christ did on the cross, but we also do it in proclamation to the world that we, your people, know that you have died on the cross for our sins and we await your return. Father, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare to take communion now, I'd like to ask a few of the deacons to come forward and help serve communion this morning. If you are visiting with us this morning, we are glad you are here, but if you're not a believer, if you have not given and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, we would ask that when the communion come around, you would just allow it to pass by, as it has no bearing on you. But if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and you are part of a church that preaches the same gospel that we do here this morning, then we ask and welcome you to take the communion with us. I'm going to read now for us Paul's description of the Lord's Supper from 1 Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
It's our tradition when the bread and the cup come around that when you receive it, you can eat the bread um, when you receive it as a symbol of your individual unity with Christ. And then hold the cup and we're going to drink all together to, as a symbol of our uh, unity as one body in Christ. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that it is to be reminded of our Savior's death and resurrection by the taking of this communion supper together. Father, I pray now for the rest of this worship service that, Father, by the preaching of your word and the singing together, that we would be sanctified, that we would be edified as one body, looking to our Savior for life, for reconciliation, for all the grace that you give us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. And let's stand and sing together uh, hymn number 400, Jesus at Your Holy Table. It's a hymn about what we've just done together. Uh, Participate together in communion. Jesus at your holy table, may our hearts united be. Bind us with your grace and presence that redeem and set us free. Crucify our pride and hatred, light the power on which we walk. Teach us how to love each other in the way that you have taught. Christ, remind us of your passion, 
of your precious life outpoured of the love which none can fathom and our victory evermore bread of heaven wine of promise lead us with your holy word nourish us with your strong presence risen savior only lord lift your hearts and raise your voices celebrate this wondrous love join the chorus with all christians and with saints who live above silent lips now sing with gladness blinded eyes are filled with sight jesus love has pierced our darkness brought us gladness blinded eyes are filled with sight jesus love has pierced our darkness brought us home to peace and light amen you may be seated good morning church our scripture reading this morning is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 6, which will be on the screens behind me. That's Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. Hear the word of the Lord. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our merciful, heavenly Father, we come now on our knees before you. You who are perfect in your judgment, you do not pervert justice, and yet the mystery of your will, the plan that you set forth for fullness of time to rescue sinners in Christ, that is why we come to you now, Lord. We who were dead, totally unable to ask for a Savior, we who were your enemies, Rebels unwilling to submit to you and to your will. We who were fully submitted to the adversary, even Satan himself. We were passionately chasing after our sins and approving of the sins of others. How could you, a righteous God, love a wretch like me? But you, O oh God, you who whose mercy does not run out, whose grace is never spent, you made us alive in Christ. You put flesh on our dry bones so that we can sing your praise. You turned rebel, rebel soldiers into loyal subjects who look more like our king with each passing year. We who were trying to tear down the walls of your kingdom you have now reworked into servants building the heavenly city. Father, we praise you for your will 
and your mysterious plan is far above our earthly wisdom. And Lord, we praise you for the ways that you are building your city here in the midst of this area. We, we praise you for uh, Wallace Presbyterian Church and the pastor Ryan Moore, the ways that they are preaching your word and spreading your gospel. We thank you for the ways that they are working in their community in College Park and with the college students there. We ask that you would cause them to flourish, that you would cause them to draw many to yourself. And Father, we also praise you for the ways that you're working at New Carrollton Bible Church. We thank you for James Lawson and uh, the ways that he is serving in that community. And we ask that you would heal his body as he uh, fights with COVID, that you would um, bring him uh, physical healing as you've even bringing him uh, spiritual healing. And Lord, we thank you for the abundance of ministers that you've given to this church, the ways that you have blessed us with many who are able to preach your gospel. And we thank you for Will Mori Ramos and uh, the, the heart that he has to, to hear your word uh, and to spread it abroad. We ask that you would bless his preaching this morning at New Carrollton Bible, that uh, you would use his preaching mightily, that your word would go forth and that many would be um, called back from their rebellion against you. Father, we also pray that you would build your kingdom abroad. We, we pray for those in Ukraine. We ask that you would protect your people, that you would uh, redeem your remnant there, that you would give wisdom to President Zelensky and to the other leaders, that they would uh, know peace, that they would know the prince of peace, you who break the bow and shatter the spear, you burn the chariots with fire, you are the one who brings peace, and we ask that your peace would be known here on earth as it is in heaven. Come, Lord Jesus. Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts now to hear your word and to be changed by your word that we would not be hearers only, but that we would be doers, and that you would uh, preach to us through Steve, and that we would glorify our Father in heaven. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together hymn 448, Before the Throne of God Above. strong and perfect a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hand my name is written on his heart i know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can bid me then depart. No tongue can bid me then depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward I look and see him there Who made an end of all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the 
justice satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me Perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 8 as we continue our study and exposition of this beautiful gospel. We're this morning in Luke chapter 8, looking at verses 26 through 39. Last week, we looked uh, in chapter 8 at verses um, 22 through 25, uh, and therein we saw Jesus' power over danger, Jesus' power over danger, the danger of the storm, This week, in verses 26 through 39, we're going to see his power over demons. Uh, And then next week, as we look at verses 40 through to the end, we'll look at Jesus' power over disease and death. So what I want to do is start reading in verse 22, and then I'll read through to verse 39. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke, rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time, it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs were feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus And found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. 
and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Well, this is God's living and active, holy and inspired word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let's pray and ask him to bless not only its reading, but our hearing of it. Father, we thank you. Oh God, your word is so clear. We admit it's exciting. And Father, we pray that we would not just come to this text, though, this morning as curious, curious people wanting to know a little bit more about this demon-possessed man. Father, we pray that you would draw our hearts and minds to be most curious about the power of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that as your word is studied, Lord, it wouldn't be just studied so that we would be better equipped, but Father, that we would, by your Spirit, be better submitters to it, and that we would follow Christ and sit at his feet. We pray this, Lord, for our good. Our Father, we would be amiss to not pray that you would protect us now from all evil, and Father, that your Spirit would fill this room and our presence and our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you see the connection between last week's text and this week's text? There's a parallel, and we'll look at it a little bit later, but isn't it interesting that in both texts, the people were filled with fear after Jesus demonstrated his power? This week, the scene and the setting is set for us. In verse 26, they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. This is not a throwaway line. Every little detail in all of Scripture is filled with importance, and this is an important text nonetheless. Here we see Jesus specifically go to a place that, if you knew the time and the country at this time, was filled with people who were not Jews. In other words, what's surprising about verse 26 is that Jesus' ministry perhaps in fulfillment of the promise that God gave to Abraham, is expanding outside the bounds of his own covenant people. Here is a Savior indeed for all the world. But all the world is a scary place, isn't it? Well, they go to the country of the Gerasenes, and as we're told, as soon as Jesus stepped out of the land, there met him a man from the city who had, plural, demons. It's as if, he saw them land and rushed with demonic speed to be there at the foot of Christ. Who is this man in verse 27? Well, he's demon-possessed, he's deranged, and he desires the company of death and decay. Here was a man who not only had a demon, but plural, demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes. A long time. I don't know what that's like. Uh, blistering during the day, freezing during the night, and he lives among the tombs. He desired to be around those who were decaying and dead. At least from a Jewish perspective, this was an unheard of place to stay. Here was a man who was not at all in his right mind. He was a man who no longer had control on his own body, his own mind and will. We're told that when, when Jesus had, had, had tried to bring the, the demons out, many times it had seized the man and he was kept under guard. But even while he was bound with chains and shackles, he had power to break them and then the demons would drive him out even deeper into the desert. The picture that we have of this man is one who has lost all individuality. He was a man without any hope at all. Demon possession was a scary, scary thing, and we'll look at that here in a second, but I want us to realize here that immediately Jesus falls onto this land of the Gerasenes and meets a man without hope. Now, 
we know how this passage is going to end. And because we know that, let us put a little bit of application here already in the beginning of our study. Jesus is able to do with the hopeless a very hopeful thing. And dear friends, here is a man who will be immediately a part of Jesus' first set of believing disciples. <laughs> uh, we are all sitting calmly and nicely in our Sunday best here at Greenboat Baptist Church this morning. Oftentimes, folks will walk in, and I usually see them first because my eyes can see right to the door and then right back here, and perhaps they don't quite fit in with our Sunday best and our calm attire. I think Jesus would, Jesus would say, ah, welcome one of my garrison friends. From our perspective, and no doubt from the perspective of the disciples, this guy was frightening, and perhaps they wanted to move around quickly. Jesus stays, stops, and looks, and interacts. I dare say, if Jesus can do hopeful things with the hopeless, and Jesus is here in our midst, I think it's encouraging for us to say, yes, he can do hopeful things for the hopeless people that by God's grace walk into our midst. Well, the battle ensues, verses 28 and 29. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you not to torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. We've seen Jesus interact with demon-possessed people before. And interestingly, back in Luke chapter 4, a demon-possessed man also refers to Jesus as Son of the Most High. If you remember back to that passage, we, we concluded that this is not just a confession of what is true. No doubt the demons know who Jesus really is. But it's also a, try, uh, a power play to try and get one up on Jesus. To be able to name someone is to be able to have some kind of authority. And so here the battle ensues where the legionnaire, demon-possessed man is saying, Ah, I know who you are, Jesus, Son of God of the Most High. And yet he is kneeling at the feet of Jesus. It's a power play that he himself knows he's going to lose. He ends this, this battle by saying, please don't throw us into the abyss, but the battle must go on. The demon-possessed man begs him not to torment him, not to torment them. Send us into the abyss, they cry. Don't torment us, verse 28. Verse 31, please, by, 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 by your grace, don't throw us away into this abyss. What is this abyss? Well, it could be, could be places that are not desert places. There's one theory uh, that demons congregated in desert places like this. And what they hated was watery places. Uh, the theory goes back to Genesis chapter 6 that when the sons of God slept with the daughters of men, and they interpret the sons of God there as fallen angels, the judgment was what? But the flood to come and wipe away. And so ever since then, if there is demonic activity, and we always see in the Gospels that are in the desert places, and they hate watery places, perhaps then the judgment is don't send me into the water. This text seems to maybe give conclusive evidence to that, because how does the text end? But the pigs who are now possessed with demons, jumping off the edge of the cliff, where? into the water. Another theory is that the abyss is the abyss of hell, and Romans chapter 10 seems to suggest this, where it refers to the bottomless pit as the abyss. Revelation 20 talks about the abyss that God will judge the demons in uh, as that bottomless abyss and bottomless pit. Whatever the, the, the place is and the judgment is, they realize that Jesus can do it, and they're begging him not to do it. He, in battle, asks a question that perhaps gets at the man's humanity. What's your name? Who are you? Can you remember who you were before you were possessed with all these demons? Still, though, under the control, the singular response is terrifying. Legion. Now, if we know our Roman history, 
A legion was that largest component of the Roman army, usually composed of upwards to 6,000 men. Now, whether this man was possessed by 6,000 demons or not, we're not sure. In Mark, we know that there were about 2,000 pigs. All we can say for sure is that he is possessed by thousands of demonic figures. No doubt the man is lost of all individuality. It makes sense then, doesn't it, that he's been without clothes. That as Matthew and Mark put it, he's been cutting himself with stones. He's been screaming in the middle of the night. And he lives away separate from the rest of, of humane society as an animal among the dead and as a dead man still living. If there's anything close to the reality that we would say is the walking dead, herein is that reality. What are demons? Well, demons are, properly speaking, fallen angels who in their rebellion against God were cast down out of heaven and now in continued battle against God do so by battling those made in the image of God. Demons are powerful beings who were in their created purposes, meant to do nothing but worship God in resplendent glory. Fiery beings with wings that flew and wings that covered their eyes and feet and could, in their spiritual nature, get around immediately and do wonderful things that we, in our limited human capacity, could not even imagine. And yet now, in their fallen depravity, their sole desire is to do all harm to God and God's people. Demonic activity seemed to be most prevalent around the time of Christ. It's not clear as you read through Scripture that demonic activity is always at a, a, a fever pitch. You, you, you see spikes in it at, at, at intense moments in redemptive history, right before the flood and again here right before the redemption that is Christ. Many commentators think that what's going on here and, and again, you get this with Genesis 6, is a kind of mockery of incarnation. So that in Genesis 6, knowing that a Messiah would come through the seed of the woman, Genesis 3, well, perhaps we too can create a seed of the woman by sons of God sleeping with the daughters of men and there in, incarnate some kind of anti-incarnation against the coming Messiah. Ah, he's come, Luke chapter 1 and 2, Perhaps now is our time to incarnate, as it were, possess men and women in order to raise up some kind of uh, antithesis against the incarnation of the Son of God. We can't be sure. Nonetheless, here is demonic activity at its worst. Now, there are usually two errors that we as readers of the text will come away with. Uh, when we read passages like this. The first error is to go to one extreme, and that is our kind of modern post-enlightenment American extreme, and to minimize or deny any existence of demonic activity altogether. Uh, this is a nice story of someone wrestling with his inner turmoils. There is no such thing as demons. There's just our inner angst and worries and, and our addictions to the things of this world. Many people believe that, and many so-called Christians believe that. But dear friends, that is one error that we must not fall into. Demons are real. Fallen angels are a clear fact of Scripture. And uh, we do not want to fall into this post-enlightenment idea. Indeed, I dare say it is Satan's idea. Nothing would make Satan happier for us to believe the lie that he doesn't exist. Because when we think he doesn't exist, therein he can do the most damage. But the other error and the other danger is to go all the way to the other extreme and to maximize or exaggerate the importance of demons so that every sin or every problem is because of Satan and demons. Now, dear friends, can I just remind us that our hearts are entirely depraved on their own and we don't need Satan in order to be as bad as we are? When the computer crashes or you're stuck in traffic, it's not Satan. <laughs> it's just the computer crashing. And, uh, and you being angry on the beltway has more to say about your heart than anything else. 
And yet, nonetheless, a balanced view would say what? Satan and his demonic forces are real. We sang it this morning. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and aimed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. That's quite literally true. On earth there is no equal to the power that is Satan. And he still wreaks havoc. Maybe not always through possession, and I think he still does possess, but certainly through whispering lies and certainly through structural forms wherein he tries to drag society down more and more into the, into the hellish pit that is sin and depravity. I know of good Christian friends who grew up in places like Haiti who would say, you know, in Haiti we fall into the extreme of, of seeing Satan everywhere. Uh, but Steve, uh, I have seen Satan in Haiti. And uh, things that happen with voodoo is not fake. And so don't play around and don't fall into the mistake that thinking that Satan's not there at all. He is. And it's powerful and it's scary. But dear friends, the balanced view always has Christ at the center. And we're reminded, aren't we, in Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And yet we can battle because we have a warrior king who does what he does here. Now again, outside the faith that we have in Jesus Christ, I'd, I'd want to remind many of us here that without Christ, we are just as dire a position as this man, this legion man is here. Phil Reichen comments that this is what sin does to us all. Even if our own situation seems less extreme, the Bible tells us that the sinful mind is hostile to God. It describes all people as dead in trespasses and sins. It says that apart from a saving relationship with Christ, we are alienated and hostile in mind. Worst of all, we cannot save ourselves. On the contrary, we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all that is spiritually good. Why? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Satan is powerful and real. And yet this passage is here to tell us more about Jesus Christ than it is the demons and Satan. What we see here is Jesus' saving power. Dear friends, let's come away with that as the most important part of this text. Now to be sure, the demons knew the reality of who and what Jesus was. He refers to him as son of the living God. Here is the God-man, Jesus Christ, and he bows down at his feet. As James Wright, James, the brother of Jesus, the demons also believe and they shudder. Demons believe in Jesus. They know the power of God and it makes them absolutely tremble. Here he is trembling. He's stalling for time. He's trying to get one up by naming him. Hey, don't do this. Don't do that. It's a scary idea to think that demons shudder more at the reality of Jesus and his judgment than we do. Dear friends, we ought to be, I dare say, just as fearful at the power and reality of God. But it's also clear that the demons here also believe in hell. Look at verse 28 and, and, and verse 31. Don't, don't torment us. And again, verse 31, they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Again, the abyss, I think, is most likely the place of the dead. That bottomless pit of Revelation 20. The demons know that this is their final doom. And, and, and Revelation 20, 21 refers to, to that abyss as their everlasting torment. So yes, they're trembling here. And a side note, it is, again, a good sign, not a good sign, if demons are more scared of hell than we are. It wasn't yet time, though, for the demons to be sent into the abyss. Instead, where does he cast them? He casts them into a herd of pigs, verse 32 and 33. Now a large herd of pigs were feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, not to, uh, begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission, 
Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. A couple of things to note here. One, Jesus gave them permission. That is a theme and a thread throughout the entire course of Scripture. Satan and his demons cannot do anything outside of the providential allowance of God. Remember Job, where Satan comes to God and says, look at your servant Job. I'll bet you I can get him to sin. But he only gets to go after Job after what? God gives him permission. Dear friends, that's a truth we ought to always carry with us. Satan and his demons are all but dogs held on a leash by the providential power of our God. They can only go so far. That should give you some comfort. But secondly, why the pigs? What's up with these pigs? I don't know. There's a number of reasons. It could be that um, pigs were a stand-in as a symbol for the, um, the um, unworthiness and uncleanliness of what was going on. Remember, in Jewish law, pigs were not to be handled or ate. It could be that this was judgment upon maybe Jewish or Gentile pig farmers who were selling to Jews or Jews selling to Gentiles, and they ought not to have been. So Jesus kind of judges them in sending the pigs over. Maybe it's a, a testimony of um, uh, the, 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 the pigs being itself an unclean destruction of what these demons are going to get in the final abyss as he sends them into the water. This is a foretaste of their final destruction in the abyss. I'm not sure what it is. I think at least we can say these pigs were created by God and here used by God for his judging glory. <laughs> he knew exactly what he was going to do. And, um, and again, pigs are not made in the image and likeness of man. So uh, even if you send a check to PETA every week, it's okay. God's judgment here is good and right. But here's the more important thing. This is Jesus not just showing his power over the spiritual realm. This is Jesus showing us that he is the coming king. He is conquering not just demons. Dear friends, the language of legion is portent a whole army of legions. Satan no doubt knew that the incarnation had happened. The spiritual warfare of the Gospels is ramped up to a level 10 that was just not present in the time just before Christ. And so all-out attack is going towards Christ. Satan couldn't get him out in the wilderness, and so let's, let's throw at him this man full of 6,000 demons. Let's see what that does to him. And our warrior king comes, and he does battle, and he wins. He sends them into the pigs, and the pigs drown. Herein is the beautiful scene where we see the liberation of this man. Look at verse 34 and following. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Oh, dear friends, here's the saving power of Jesus. True liberation wholeness of the man, final peace, spiritual healing, and, and did you notice a desire to sit at the feet of Jesus and be with him? That's the power of Christ. In the most hopeless of men, we have the most assuring and comforting hope in this picture. Now, what's the response of the watching world? Look at the end of verse 35. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country, the garrisons, asked them to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. Friends, they were afraid. They were seized with fear. Twice Luke tells us of their response. There's a parallel here. Last week, as we've already noted, we saw the disciples afraid of Jesus' power of the storm. And here we see the townspeople afraid of Jesus' power over demons. But the irony is that the fear we see here is not one grounded in faith. For the disciples, they were afraid, but kept sticking with Jesus. They didn't want to go anywhere else. Here, the fear moves the people to push Jesus away. Many commentators make it an issue of economics. 
Ah, they were just upset that he did away with their cash crop of sending all the pigs into the sea. I don't, I don't think that's it. I think Luke would have said that they were angry at what he did with the pigs, but instead he says they're afraid, they're seized with fear. I think they realized that Jesus had extraordinary power to change people. Even the most hopelessly lost and spiritually dead of people like this demoniac. No one else could change this man. Shoot, they couldn't even get control of him. The, the, the text says that they had to bind him with chains, but he broke the chains and had the strength of many men in just one body. No one could get a handle on this guy except Jesus. And I think they realized that if Jesus had that kind of power to change this kind of guy, they realized that, they would ha- that, they, that, that he had the power to do what he wanted with them as well. That scares people. Friends, I dare say that that still scares people. A lot of people know who Jesus is. They know that he's real. He know, they know that he's alive. They know that he's God and a savior and, that, and, 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 and that, that, that he can do things in their life. And they still push him away because they're afraid that he can really change their life. You may not be possessed by demons, but a whole lot of people are certainly possessed by their desires for sin possessed by their addictions, possessed by their lust for power or for pleasure or for prosperity. And they know, if if I come to Jesus and Jesus has his way with me, if he lets forth his full power upon my heart and my life, everything will be different. Everything will change. And I'll no longer get to enjoy the pleasures and the little sins and the things of this world like I have been. And people are afraid of Jesus because they're much much too in love with this world. All the things of this world. The legion things of this world. Thousands of little lusts that keep us preoccupied. That's a fear that pushes Jesus away. It's a fear that, like Gollum in the Lord of the Rings, desires the dehumanizing effect of that little power all pushing away the only hope in life that we can find in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Do you know what the scariest verse in this whole passage is? It's not the legion of demons. It's not the man crying out naked in a tomb. No, no, no. The scariest verse in this entire passage is what we see at the end of verse 37. So he got into the boat and he returned. Dear friends, the worst judgment Jesus could ever inflict upon you is to leave you. To leave you in your own desires and wants and to honor the request, your request, that you be left alone and not change. Some of you may be right on that line right now. Continually, like flies, circling the stink of your sin. You know Christ can make you whole, can give you peace. But you also know that that requires some new habits in your life. That requires some some new ways of living. You know that that requires putting away the decaying and and death-dragging sins that you so love. Will you push them away or will you not? Dear friends, if you're here right now and you've not yet come to Christ, I not only encourage you, but I I call you by the power of God that has been granted to me as a minister of the gospel to repent now and put your faith in Jesus. Repent means to turn away and to put your faith in means to fall and rest in love with him who is your only savior. And by hearing that and believing that, I promise you, Jesus will make you whole. It's so much more comforting outside of the graveyard of death in this world. And I know you think that whatever sin that is that has you, it would be the end of your world if you let that go. Perhaps letting it go means a little bit of humility and a little bit of light shining into the darkness of that graveyard and other people seeing who you really are. Other people bearing and opening up your heart 
so that you can show them the legion of little lusts that you have. And it does hurt at first. But I guarantee you, like this man here sitting at the feet of Jesus, you will never want to leave him again. Now, this leads us to the last and final irony of this entire passage, which is verses 38 and 39. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. The unbelieving cities of the Gerasen region saw Jesus, were filled with fear, and pushed him away. And Jesus said, okay. The demoniac, who had been saved by Jesus, said, Jesus, stay with me. And Jesus said, no, and pushed him away. And yet, what a blessing that was, not only to him, but dare I say, to the very people that pushed Jesus away in the first place. Here is nothing other than a great commission, the, the, the first seeds of, of a missionary work that would carry on through the book of Acts and is carrying on still now. This man was sent by Christ to not follow him, but to stay with the very people who didn't want Christ. And he said, go and tell them about me. Go and continue to tell them what I've done for you. Now, just consider that for a moment. This guy has been living naked in a graveyard, chained up for a long time. He was no doubt probably the butt of jokes of all the school children who passed by the graveyard. There goes Legion again. Don't get too close. Moms would, would scare their children into obedience at night. If you keep doing that, you're going to be like Legion down at the graveyard. This man was frightening. And now he strolls into town and maybe cozies up at the bar stool next to you at the, at the garrison pub. <laughs> you could still see the scratches and marks that he cut himself with in stones. He probably still has a little stank on him. And he says, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. Now, from our perspective as Christians, who give so much time thinking through how to be winners of souls and to be winsome and to get into the culture and help people hear us, is that a winning move? From our modern context, dare I say, that will not sell books. You will not be a good missionary if you follow that model. But that's Jesus' model. Just be you. And all of your ugly stank and all of your past and history, there was no training. The guy didn't go to seminary. There was no book that Jesus gave to him and said, here's the, here's the Romans road on how to rightly do it. And look, I say that as somebody who is very clear and high in my wanting to be theologically precise. But the point here is that Jesus just sent the man and said, tell them what I did for you. Tell them about me. I want that to encourage you to not cripple in fear as you come into contexts where other people have been pushing Jesus away and, and you think, well, what can I say to them? Certainly they know about Jesus. I, I, I can't say anything. Jesus has just said, go and talk. I wonder if we won't get to heaven and we meet somebody there who said, oh yeah, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus in his ministry. And we would say, oh, were, were you drawn to him and come to faith right there? And they say, no. I saw him in one of the most powerful things he did in his ministry and it absolutely terrified me and I ran away. I wanted nothing to do with that powerful savior because I knew he would change my life. Well, well, what? I don't get it. Why are you here? All who reject Christ, he's the way, the truth, and life. You don't get to come to heaven. There was this demoniac whose life was changed and he just kept coming back and telling me about what Jesus did for him. And little by little, this man's changed life. This man's direction to look at Christ who changed his life wore on me. And something miraculous happened. God changed my heart. And I'll tell you what, the minute I believed in Christ, I saw that what that man went through as a demoniac was no different from what I was going through when I lived in the town of the Gerasenes. We sang earlier this morning, when we look at Christ, 
we confess that my name is graven on his hands and, and my, my soul is written on his heart. I was struck by those lines. Here was a man who, who in his demon possession was engraving demonic marks upon his skin. His soul was more and more being conformed to the darkness of hell. And yet in just a word, the life-changing, gospel-penetrating power of Christ's word. His life is now graven on his hands. And his soul is now graven on his heart. My dear friends, the power of Jesus makes everyone whole, everyone spiritually clean, and we have the power to now go and do likewise as we tell the world about our Savior. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do look to and glory in our Savior Jesus Christ this morning. For Father, we look at the filth and the stink and the wretchedness of our own hearts. We look at our, the sins that so easily entangle us. Father, we look at perhaps who we once were, completely entrenched in this world, driven by the passions and lusts of our own hearts. Father, fulfilling every desire within us. Father, looking really no different than this man who we've seen this morning. And Father, so we have seen this morning of the power of Jesus Christ, the power to change a life, the power to conquer all of the powers of hell. Powers that, that, Father, we frankly do not think about very often, that we don't come in contact in a visible and tangible way very often in this country. Father, Satan doesn't come to us by fear and by uh, possession, usually in, in here in America, Lord, but Oh, but Father, he comes with that still, small voice, whispering, using the power of temptation to draw our hearts and our minds away from Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we acknowledge our need for Jesus Christ this morning, our need for his cleansing work within us, our need for his spirit poured out in us, conforming us, changing us into the image of Jesus Christ. Oh, for, Father, would you work within us this morning, this power? Would you remind us of who we are in Jesus Christ? And would you remind us of the gospel call that that bears upon us to, to go forth and to teach others about what Jesus has done for us in his atoning death and resurrection on our behalf? Oh, Father, would you use this, these few moments this morning to remind us that we are called to go forth and to preach Jesus Christ, who calls sinners to himself, who changes lives by his work within them. Father, we thank you for all that you do. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray this morning. Amen. Let's stand and sing from the songbook, Across the Lands. You're the Word of God the Father From before the world began Every star and every planet Has been fashioned by your hand 
all creation holds together by the power of your voice let the skies declare your glory let the land and seas rejoice you're the author of creation you're the lord of every man and your cry of love rings out across the Yet you left the gaze of angels, came to seek and save the lost, and exchanged the glory of heaven for the anguish of a cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a word you calmed the sea, yet how silently you suffered the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the With a shout, you rose victorious, wrestling victory from the grave, and ascended into heaven, leading captives in your way. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own, from each tribe in across the land. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the be seated for announcements. Our first announcement this morning, uh, Matt Dobbins is going to come up and share with us about the, the CEF VBS coming up in two weeks. Hey, good morning, church. Um, so on August 1st through August 5th, we're, Child Evangelism Fellowship is going to be coming here to host uh, our first um, five-day club. So for those who aren't familiar with what Child Evangelism, Evangelism Fellowship and the five-day club, what those are, um, during that time, uh, there'll be 90 minutes each day from th 3, 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., uh, where CEF, along with members from our church, will join together to, to bring kids in, ages I think 5 to 12 is what they target, and um, basically present a gospel story to them and then sing some songs, have some crafts, and play some games. So if, you, if you'd be interested in having your children involved in that, um, there's already a sign-up sheet out in the, in the foyer area, the entryway there. Um, we just ask that you uh, put your child's name and then uh, your, your name as the, as the parent or the contact, along with any food allergies, because there will be a snack provided during that time, and we want to make sure everyone's you know, good to go there. Um, yeah, and uh, we're also looking for some uh, volunteers. Uh, if you're interested in uh, coming alongside us and just, um, you know, um, being with the kids and, um, you know, working with them a little bit, it w wouldn't be a teaching responsibility, but more just a, a helping responsibility. Um, we'd love for you to, to be involved in that. The only requirement is that you have already been, ha had a background check uh, through the church. So if you haven't, if you're not already serving with kids in some capacity, it might be a little too late. Um, but if you are serving with kids in that capacity and have had, have had a background check through the church, um, then please talk to, to Daniel Gomez or myself, and uh, we can um, 
Wednesday, I talk more about that. So August 1st through the 5th, Monday through Friday from 3 to 4.30. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Perhaps uh, you were thinking this morning, well, how is it that, that God equips believers to fight against the powers of hell? He does so primarily uh, through prayer. One of the ways that we do that is to commune with Jesus Christ through prayer. And so we have every week an evening service right here. We gather again on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. where we come together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, calling upon him primarily in prayer. That's what the evening services are designed to do. We, we come and we adore Jesus in prayer. We, we confess our sins and we ask the Spirit to to help us fight the sin and temptation that entangles us. We pray for one another as we go forth uh, through the rest of our week and we face uh, various trials that, that, that Satan uses to tempt us and draw us away. We pray for one another in those things. And so, uh, you know, I would encourage each and every one of you to come back again this evening for our evening service where we pray, we do hear again from the word of the Lord, and uh, we fellowship with one another. It's always a sweet time of fellowship as well. So here again this evening at 6 p.m. for our evening service, uh, your, your heart and your soul will be blessed by, by joining us once again. And uh, we also have our normal kind of weekly activities. You can see your bulletin for all those various things, small groups, Bible studies, Sunday schools that, that are happening throughout the week. Each of those things, again, designed to equip you and to edify you and build you up into the image of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, a few things to mark on your calendars. Matt, Matt off, uh, already gave you one. Number two, next week, uh, after the morning service, we have our, pot, our quarterly potluck and business meeting. So uh, the potluck is for everyone. So if you're visiting with the first time this morning, uh, you can come again next week and share a meal, get to know the church, and uh, if you are a church member, uh, look for an email this week uh, that will do, give you uh, some instructions about what to bring. But uh, if you're a visitor, come and just enjoy some food and some fellowship. But after that, if you are a member, you will stay, you will stay, and, uh, and take part in the, the church's business. God has tasked the church to do his business and so we want to do that. One of which we will be doing is v voting on whether Philip Grove will be continuing on as an elder for the next three years. So uh, we, Steve and I, fully endorse him, and we love having him serve. And so, but we would encourage you to come out and vote, uh, and talk to Phil, encourage him, or uh, talk to Steve or I if you have any concerns. But. Uh, we, we want to encourage you to do that. But there is a business meeting where we'll be, we will be doing the business of the church. So if you are a member, it is your business to be doing the business of the church, and so plan on staying after that. Finally, the, the last event to mark on your calendars is the Labor Day Festival. As we heard last week and we've been reminded, the Greenbelt Labor Day Festival is a kind of a big celebration, a big deal in the city of Greenbelt and surrounding areas. And it is a unique opportunity that we have as a church to, to be in the community and to share the gospel. Again, we were reminded this morning of the gospel imperative to tell others about what Jesus has done for you. And so we have a chance where we have a booth to tell other people about what Jesus has done for us. And so it, it, there will be a sign up coming in the future, but mark it on your calendars all weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, we have a booth out there where we tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So mark it on your calendars. Plan for at least one of those days or perhaps a, a few hours on a couple of those days to spend time that, uh, at the booth telling others about Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you to, to, to mark that on your calendars. Would you now stand as we receive this morning's benediction? To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.